Today we're going to talk about a topic that a lot of people ask me in many different ways, in many different times. People ask me the same question, why does bad things happen to good people? And this question comes in many different ways, because bad things, it's a matter of how you look at things. Bad things can be, you know, something small can be considered to somebody a bad thing. But I get it in so many different ways and so many times that people ask me, why, wh how do you explain that bad things happen dafka to the good people? Yeah, it also happens to not so good people, but why dafka to good people? And when we understand, at least we're going to try to understand some of the reasons why that happens, it can actually apply to every little thing that happens in our life that we define it as, and we look at it as something that is bad or something negative or something that is not good. Usually the form how I get the question is, you know, for example, a lot of people ask me, well, how come the Holocaust happened? Or a lot of people now when it's becoming more and more all the terror attacks and people ask me, Why, how come you explain that you see that, you know, Dafka good people, they, 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 these are the ones who get murdered. We saw not too long ago in Harnoff, you know, people in shul, davening, praying with filling on their heads and they get killed. And not too long ago, one of the piguim in, in Yerushalayim, a rabbi died, and we see many of the piguim, religious people die. Not that I'm saying that the not religious people are not good, but the question is sometimes people say, why, why, why don't bad people suffer from these things? And it's not only terror attacks, it can be many other things. Not too long ago, somebody asked me about a, 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 a man that passed away very young, left behind a wife and seven kids. And both the kids and the mother, they, they're like, why? How do you explain that? What, what's good out of it? What comes good out of this thing in such a tragedy? And on the other hand, every day, somebody experiences something that is bad or something that is negative in their eyes. So it all boils down to the same point that we all experience things in our life that we define them as bad or many different ways how we define them. So in essence, we don't know why things happen. This is Ratzon Hashem. This is the will of Hashem and we cannot understand why things happen. You can trace it all the way back to the beginning. Why did, why did there have to be a sin? Why did Adam and Chava have to sin? If Hashem wanted everything to be so good, then why did he allow for the snake to come into Gan Eden and mess things up? And why did Hashem allow this and why did Hashem allow that? Ultimately, you can point on any point on, in our history and ask why did Hashem allow this to happen? So ultimately, we don't understand why things happen in the world, good or bad. The best way to define it is how we see things in this world is how we look at things. Because somebody can look at something and it will be in, in his or her eyes good and a different person will look at the exact same thing, it's gonna, not going to be good. Because we're looking through our eyes through this screen and how we paint the screen, that's how we're going to look at things. Take now a stained glass window. If you're looking through the window and it has a lot of colors, so whatever's on the other side will be very colorful. You're taking a very dirty windshield, but you're going to look on the other side. It's going to look dirty and look, going to look very dim. So our eyes are our windshield of our soul. So we kind of define how we see things. So it's not necessarily something is bad. It's just how we define to see it, how we choose to see it. So in essence, we don't really know why things happen. Ultimately, if Hashem wanted to let us know, He would let us know right from the beginning why things happen, and we would accept it, and we would live with it. The point is that Hashem doesn't want us to know. And that's why He created the world in a concealment. You know, the word world in Hebrew is olam, comes from the word he'elem. Hashem wanted to conceal Himself. He didn't want us to see Him. So ultimately, He didn't want us to know everything. If He would want us, He would let us know. And we see throughout history that all the time Hashem was concealed. There were times in history that Hashem revealed Himself. In the time of the giving of the Torah, in Matan Torah, in the time of the Holy Temple. They used to see the Shekhinah. 
There were times that they saw, in a re very revealed way, they saw Giluya Lukut, a godly revelation, but the rest of the time they didn't. So ultimately we don't even know and we don't understand why things happen. Now, in essence there are a few ways to understand why bad things happen. One of the things is that I do a certain action in this world and I bring on myself a reaction. I spoke about it in one of the previous classes. That when I do a certain action, it doesn't matter, it can be positive or negative. I will bring on myself a reaction right away. If I do a positive action, then the reaction that I would get back at me, what would be reflected back at me, is a positive reaction. I smile to somebody, most likely I'll get a smile back. I'll scream at somebody, most likely I'll get a, a, a yell back. Shlomo Amalek calls it kamayim apanim alapanim. Same way that how a person would look into a reflection of a water, or in our days it's more common to look in a mirror. If I smile to the person in the mirror, the person in the mirror will smile back at me. So this, whatever I throw out there, that's most likely what's going to come back. Obviously if I do something negative, most likely the reaction that I'm going to get is negative. A lot of people translate it and say Hashem is punishing me, or Hashem is being mean to me. Hashem is not doing nothing. Hashem is standing on the side and looking at you and wondering why, you, why you're behaving like that. So here comes the question. So if a, if a lot of people, they do good, why do they get the bad? If, why is their reaction bad? So the first way to understand why bad things happen is what I put out there. I do a certain action and I get back a reaction. If I throw now a stone at, the, at, a, at a window, the window will break. I can't blame even the stone and I can't blame the window. I can only blame myself. So this is one way to understand why bad things happen. Now, it's not always black and white. Nothing in the Torah is black and white. You can't say, oh, this happened because of that. And people who come and try to analyze and say, this particular thing happened because of that, it's a, it's a very wrong way to analyze things because ultimately you don't know. But in general, one of the ways to understand why bad things happen is, 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 is a reaction. Another thing that we can understand, try to understand why negative things happen, is because we, are this, we know that we all are reincarnated. And we're all here for at least a couple times already. Larizal explains that we have to come down to this world to do all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action. And most people have to come back here over and over and over, mainly because they didn't finish all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action. We know of one individual in our history that was able to do it in one shot. This is David HaMelech, King David. He was able to do all 613 mitzvot in one time. And we know from many Kabbalah books that especially the Arizal was revealing a certain individual in our history who, the, who is the reincarnation. And we know about David HaMelech that there's no Gilgul of him. There's no reincarnation of David HaMelech. But most people do come back here in reincarnations for, for a couple reasons. One of the reasons is because they have to complete all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action. A lot of the Gilgulim, a lot of the reincarnation is because somebody in one of their lives messed up and then he has to come back here to fix it. So we don't really know why or how. Very few individuals in our history were able to know that Rizal would be able to look at a person and to know all his Gilgulim and what his Tikkun is. But probably and most likely all of us are here to complete the cycle of the 613 mitzvot and to fix all sorts of blemishes that we did in the past. Now we don't even know what we did in the past. But there's a very good chance that most of us are here to fix something that we did in a previous life. And as a result from that we will suffer from negative things in our life that we don't understand why. It could very much be that 500 years ago I messed something up and I was giving the opportunity to come back down to this world to rectify it, to fix it. Which, when you think of it, it's a very kind act from the heavenly court. The heavenly court found me guilty of doing something and they said, look, we're going to give you an option to come back down here and fix it. So, we know that many times we come back here to fix things and we don't understand why. The reality is that Hashem Mesovev, Hashem turns everything around 
that we come back here to, to, to fix something. I don't remember if, I, I might have told you the story, but there's a story that happened here in Tzfat about 500 years ago, that there was a very rich man, and he couldn't marry off his daughter. His daughter couldn't find a shidduch. And finally she found a nice young man who was a yeshiva bacher, sitting in a yeshiva and learning Torah all day long. And the father was not so happy about the shidduch, but finally the, the girl found who to marry, so he was like, okay. And he came to the bride and groom and he told him, listen, uh, as a present, I'm going to give you a certain amount of money, half of my fortune, so you can live your life. So, a month after the wedding, the wife, the bride dies. So the father comes to the groom and he tells him, I want my money back. So the groom tells him, Apitom, why should I give you the money back? We had a deal. So the father says, no, the deal was that I'm giving you the money so you can support my daughter for the rest of your life. But my daughter died, I want the money back. So the groom said, okay, let's go to the Rav. Let's ask the, the, the opinion of the, of the Beit Din. So they go here to Yosef Karo. And Yosef Karo said, no, you have to give the money back. So the groom was not happy with the decision. So he's like, okay, I want to see the Arizal. I want to talk to the Arizal. So they go to the Arizal. And the Rizal says, no, you have to, you're going to keep the money. You have to keep the money. So, of course, the father was very shocked. Why does he have to keep the money? The Yosef Karo, the Dayan, told him that he can get the money back. So the Rizal says, listen, all three of you, the father, the daughter, and the groom, are all a reincarnation. And in a previous life, you were all partners. And the father and the daughter used to steal from their partner, who was the groom. And the Rizal says, you all three of you came back in this reincarnation, and now he's getting his money back. And he told the father, if you demand the money, if you take the money, then you and your daughter, your soul will not have a tikkun. You're not going to fix what you did in a previous life that you stole from him, and you're all going to have to come back here again. So give, back up, give up the money, and you'll finish your tikkun. So like that, there's thousands and thousands of stories that we see that sometimes a group of people come back to this world to fix something together. So ultimately, when we come back to this world, in a lot of cases, we come back with a, a big group of people. So we have a strong connection to our friends, to our family, for sure to our uh, wife and husband, because the wife and the husband, in most cases, come back in the same reincarnation. So another reason why bad things happen to us in our life is because in a previous life I messed up and now I'm having the opportunity to fix things up. And I should look at it, not only me, anyone should look at it as a very good and kind opportunity that I can actually fix something that I did in the, in the past. Therefore, when I have bad things that happen to me, I should accept it and say, okay, Baruch Hashem, Hashem is <laughs> cleaning my debt. Now, the thing is that we know, I explained to you a couple of times, that our soul is built from five levels. The lowest level is called nefesh, then comes ruach, then comes neshama, and then a higher level from that is called chaya, and the highest level of our soul is called yechida. Yechida comes from the word in Hebrew yechid, yichud, meaning that a very strong connection. This is what's called chilek eloka, a piece of our soul that belongs to, it's a piece of Hashem. This is a very holy piece that doesn't even, we don't even interact with it. Most people don't even ever, ever reach to that level. Very few tzaddikim reach to the level of Yechida. But below that is the level that is called Chaya. Chaya is, a, is a, 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 high, a very high level of the Neshama and it doesn't even penetrate the body, mainly because it's such a high level. And this is kind of surrounding the body. This is what's called an Or Makif. People also call it Aura. This chaya is what's called tzelem. We read in Sefer Bereshit, B'Tzelem Elokim Nivra Adam, that Hashem created us in the image of Him. Tzelem can also be translated as a shadow, something that is a reflection. But the tzelem is, is, a, is the second highest part of our neshama. Now the tzelem is built from thousands of thousands of sparks. And the amount of sparks that are in our tzelem is the amount of sparks that I have to fix in my life. And these are the amount of days that I will get in my life. So if a person got 
80 years to live in this life means take 80 years times 365 days per year. The amount you're going to get, this is the amount of sparks that the, his tselem is built from. And this is the amount of sparks that he has to letaken, to fix throughout his life. And if I have much less sparks to fix, then I'll get to live here in this world 40 years. And if I have much less sparks to fix, then I'll get 20 years. Doesn't mean that it's a punishment, rather it means that this is the amount of work that I need to do. The Or Chaim HaKadosh explains it, that in previous generations, the souls were much greater souls. So the capacity of spiritual work that they were able to handle was so much greater that we see in the first generations, they lived hundreds of years. Adam Rishon lived 930 years. And in that generation, they all lived 800 years, 900 years. And slowly, slowly with the generations, it went down. We see already that Noah was already much less than that. When it comes down to the generation of Abraham Avinu, there was already 180 years, 170 years. With the generations, the amount of years we see is, is, is going down. Now? Now we're? That's a good sign. It's a good sign. It means our neshamot are in a much higher level. The Orachim explains, he gives a parable of a king that hired many, many artists and he gave them a lot of uh, expensive rubies and diamonds and stones. And he told each artist, he gave a certain amount of stones and a certain amount of time to create something out of it. And then when the time was up, he went back to all the artists and he wanted to see each one what they, what they were able to make. And each artist got a certain amount of stones. One he gave them 30 days, one he gave 60 days. So the parable goes on that the same with Hashem, that he gives each and every one of our souls a certain amount of gems and rubies and diamonds, and he wants us to do something very special with it. And each person gets a certain amount of days. So he explains, based on the Zohar, that each Neshama has a certain quota of godly sparks that he has to elevate and to, to fix. And the Orachim explains that in the previous generations, the souls were in a much greater capacity. They were able to work on much more uh, sparks. Therefore, they lived for much longer. And then the generations yeah, happened what's called miuta dorot. The generations went lower and lower in the level. So they got much less sparks to fix. But the reality is that each one of our tselem is built from thousands of sparks. And the amount of days that we get to live, this is the amount of sparks that we have to fix. Of course, there's, it's, you know, there's some changes along the way, because a person can do a lot of great mitzvot and gain what's called arichut yamim, extra time. And chas v'shalom, a person can do the complete opposite and do all sorts of severe sins that will actually cut the time in half. That chas v'shalom, he will be judged for mitah bidei shamayim, death by the heavenly court. But in general, we have a certain amount of days set in our life. And every day, if I do what I'm supposed to do, praying, learning, mitzvot, everything that I have to do, then that day, when I go to sleep, the spark goes up with me, and I elevate that spark of the tzelem. And the thing is that if you see, if you're looking at our lifespan, we know, according to Kabbalah, that... When a person is born, he gets the level of nefesh, the lowest level of the neshama. When a boy becomes bar mitzvah and a girl becomes bat mitzvah, she gets, she and or he, they get the level of ruach. Then when they turn 20, you get the level of neshama. If you see, till 20, we grow and we grow and we grow, so our bodies grow and so our powers and our intellect and the mind, everything is developed in those 20 years. Once we hit the 20 years and we get the level of neshama, then our life goes for as many as years as we get. But from a certain year, then the body starts deteriorating and deteriorating. And we see old people, they start losing their eyesight, they start losing their memory, they start physically, they become uh, weaker. That's because they already fixed most of their nitzotzot and the, the, the power of the neshama gets weaker and weaker because it lost already the majority of its sparks, because it was, the, those sparks were already elevated. Darizal explains from that, based on that, why sleeping is so important, because while you sleep, even though you think nothing much is happening, 
But in the spiritual level, a lot is happening because the neshama goes up. He takes with it the spark that it elevated that day. That's why I keep reiterating in all, uh, all our classes the importance of Kriyat Shema Lamita. Because Kriyat Shema Lamita is when a person really does tshuva. So he's actually eleva- able to elevate that spark. Because if I wasn't good that entire day, I'm going to have a problem. That spark was not fixed and I can't elevate it that day. You do Kriyat Shema Lamita, you do tshuva. You say your sins out loud, you do vidu, you, sit, you do cheshbon nefesh. I, that's why I'm, I'm so, you know, fanatic about Kriyat Shema Lamita, because you really, not only that you, you, you guard your body, which as a result protects your body and your soul, you're also completing your daily cycle. And you're ele- able to elevate this godly spark. So when a lot of people see a, a child that dies, or a young man that dies, it's not a punishment. It's rather that he came down to this world for a certain amount of days. That's what he was given. That's, that's his job. He was hired for 20 years. He was hired for 30 years. And that's it. He's done. He's gone. In his, in his eyes, in the Neshama's eyes, he finished his, his, his mission. And the the Divine Providence, turns it around that the family... They have to suffer the loss of a father, or a loss of a child, or a loss of a mother, or however Hashem turns it around. But that's also part of the divine providence that Hashem decides that these particular neshamot will have to suffer that for whatever reason. And this is the reason that we'll never understand. This is the reason that we don't understand how Hashem governs the world. We'll never understand it. We're going to understand it very soon when Mashiach comes, that everything will be revealed and everything will be obvious. Now, one reason to understand why we go through so much hardship here and why people suffer, and the level of suffering depends on how the the person is looking at it. Because one person can have problems from here to, to, to Yerushalayim, and they're like, okay, you know, whatever, they don't really get excited from that. They accept the Yisurim, they don't, it doesn't faze them. And some people, a few minor things happen in their life, and who they, they can't even handle it. They can't even handle like the basic things. So you define how severe it is. Because you look at it, you, you can decide if you're accepting it to be something big, or if you're, okay, whatever, this is, this is the reality, I'm going to accept it. The thing is that one of the reasons why we go through hardship, is like I said in the beginning, is, is our own actions. Because when a person does a certain action, and he brings himself on himself a reaction, then if a person did a mitzvah, that is not a problem, or a good deed. But if a person did a sin, then there are different types of sins. If chas v'shalom, a person did not know a positive mitzvah, then, you know, all he needs to do, that person needs to do tshuva, and that's it, and he's forgiven, and he moves on. In essence, he lost the opportunity to bring that godly light to the world on that particular moment, then he will have to somehow get it back. But if Chas a person did a, a negative uh, mitzvah, uh, avar al, al mitzvah lotas, it made, it basically uh, it didn't do a negative uh, precept, then if it's something, something simple, the person needs to do tshuva. If a person does tshuva, then the tshuva puts the sin on hold, then he has to wait till Yom Kippur, and then Yom Kippur comes and washes off the sin. And these are like very uh, basic and not such uh, uh, severe sins. But if Chaz Shalom, a person did one of the severe sins that fall under the categories of karet or mitabi dei shamayim, death by the heavenly court, which are severe sins like, you know, desecrating Shabbat, Lashon Ara, eating chametz on Pesach. I'm not going to go through the entire list, but the severe sins that go under the category of karet, which are 36 of them, two of them are positive, one of them is the uh, sacrifice of Pesach, which we don't have. As other Hashem, we're going to have it this year. And the other one is circumcision. And the other 34 that are negative that have to do with us is Shabbat, Pesach, Yom Kippur, all the forbidden relations, and some other things that really don't relate to us if a person does a seance or a lot of things that have to do with the sacrifices. But there are a lot of sins that Chas Shalom, the result is called Mitah Bidei Shamayim, death by the heavenly court. Lying, cheating, stealing, and so forth. So these sins, if a person does tshuva, the tshuva puts the sin on hold. Then comes Yom Kippur. The Yom Kippur also keeps the sin on hold. 
And then a person has to go through what's called Yisurim. Yisurim memarkim. A person has to go through hardship. And the hardship is what washes off the dirt of the sin. So if a person, chas v'shalom, did a, a, a sin, then we did tshuva, then comes Yom Kippur, and he fasts, and he did everything. And then nothing happens. He should be very worried because it means that they didn't forgive him from Shamaim, and then he has everything is, is okay. But if starts coming all sorts of hardships and suffering and pain and issues, then it means that this, the tshuva was accepted. And now comes the Yisurim to wash things off. This is like a stain. I explained to you in one of the previous classes that our soul is dressed in levushim, in garments. And every mitzvah that I do, I create another garment. And each mitzvah creates a different piece of the garment. That at the end of my days, this is the garment that the neshama, the soul, gets dressed in, goes into the, to the, to Gan Eden, to a, or to a higher spiritual realm. But if chas v'shalom, I did a sin, then I put a blemish on the garment, I put a stain. So exactly like in this world, if I have a very small stain, all I need to do is brush it off or wash it with a little bit of water. But if chas v'shalom is a very deep stain, then I have to spray it with chemicals and wash it in boiling hot water and that, does, that doesn't help. And I have to scrub it off. Same, with the, same thing with the neshama. If there's a very severe sin, then the neshama, the stain is very severe. So it takes hardship, yesurim, to wash it off. And yes, and it hurts. But the thing is that it's better getting this Yisurim here in this world than in the world above. Because a year of Yisurim, of hardship in this world, is nothing. It's not even a second of the Yisurim or the Neshama or the soul feels in the world above. And trust me, you don't want to deal with it in the world above. You want to deal with everything here and finish with your Cheshbon, with your debt here. You don't want to leave anything to the world above because we don't even know the severity of the judgment. We don't know how it's going to be looked at in, in the heavenly court. But there's a much more deeper explanation why we go through Yisurim. In one way, our mind will never accept, understand it. Because our ears and our brain is not a vessel to accept such a thing. But we know that why did the Jews suffer for 210 years in severe slavery and torture in Mitzrayim? The only reason why they had to suffer in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, for 210 years of severe torture is for one reason, for them to come to Mount Sinai and receive the Torah and get this godly revelation. That's why they had to suffer. And this is one of the main reasons why we go through hardship in this world is because Hashem wants to give us a godly revelation. It's called the Gilu Yelukut. And the highest level of godly revelations that we know in our history was at the time of the giving of the Torah. That they actually saw the Shekhinah come down on the mountain. They heard Hashem's voice saying the Ten Commandments. They saw the sounds. They heard what they saw. They, they had the highest godly revelation that, that we heard of. Even Adam and Chava didn't have such a godly revelation. And in order for them to receive such a godly revelation, they had to go through Yisurim of 210 years of suffering, of severe suffering. Well, you know, when we're, talk, when we're reading about the time of, of the exile of Egypt, we're probably, you know, we're imagining these men carrying bricks and somebody's whipping them. It wasn't like that. It was something that our mind will not understand. We look back 70 years ago at the Holocaust and we can't understand what was going on there. And the Holocaust was four and a half years. Imagine in Mitzrayim, 210 years. And the, the description that it comes with is much worse than that. And the only reason why they had to go through that is only to reach to the level that they can get this Gilui Lukut, this godly revelation in Matan Torah. And again, our ear will never be soothed and, and our mind will never accept and understand, okay, why do I have to suffer in order for me to get a godly revelation. This I'll never understand. But we see from our history that in order for the Jews to be in the, the Ma'amad Har Sinai, to see that godly revelation, they had to go through this suffering. Which comes to give us very good news as though the level of the godly revelation we're going to see very soon when Mashiach comes after suffering for 2,000 years in Galut. So for 
210 years, imagine what godly revelation they saw in Har Sinai. Imagine what type of godly revelation we're going to see when Mashiach comes after 2,000 years of suffering. Now when we're looking at it at a very personal level, and we're focused on a very personal level, then I see my own problems. But if I jump out of my body and I'm looking at it in a very general way, then I'm one piece out of this entire system that this is something that we have to go through. It's a process that we have to go through and we're not going to understand it. Don't even try to explain or to try to think in your mind why we have to suffer this galut, this exile. But the, the answer that our sages give us is that when Mashiach is going to come, we're going to understand it. That's why we say when we read Shira Malot, we say, Beshuv Hashem et Shivat Zion, Ainu Kecholmim, we were his dreamer, this whole exile will be like a dream. Azim Ales Chok Pino. Then our mouth is going to be filled with laughter. Ulshonenu Rina. Then we're going to understand the depth of what we had to go through, and our mouth is going to be constantly praising Hashem. But we're going to have this level of schok pino, of this laughter. It's not that we're going to be like giggling and we're going to hear jokes. Rather, it's going to be like such a high level of godly revelation that is called laughter. Now, we in our mind will not understand it, at, this, at least at this point. But if you want to look at it, outside of your body, you, you look at it in a way that, wait a minute, for whatever reason, in order for me to receive a godly revelation, I have to go through hardship. And we see, we know, that when the souls go up to Shemaim, some of them are less lucky, they have to go to Genom, and the lucky ones, they go to Gan Eden, to heaven. But even the souls that go to Gan Eden, they have to cross through Genom. That's the path. They have to go through Genom, through hell. And there's two rivers that they have to cross. First is the river of fire. It's called Nahar Dino. And then there's a river of ice. And all the souls have to go through it. There's a ways. There's ways how to, to, to skip that river. I think I told you last week about it. That uh, when a man goes to the mikra, a cold mikra every morning, he skips the river of, of, uh, of ice. How do you skip that? There's, there's all sorts of ways how to skip it. One of the ways is these hardships that one goes through. There's other ways. That this is not the point. The point is that to get to Gan Eden, one must go through Genom. This is called the Yerida L'Tzorech Aliyah. In order for me to come to a higher level, I have to go to some type of a descending. It even says that the souls where they are positioned in Gan Eden, in heaven, there are endless amount of madrigot, of levels. In general, we know of two madrigot in Gan Eden, Gan Eden Tachton and Gan Eden Lelion, the lower level of Gan Eden and the higher level of Gan Eden. What does it mean? We'll never understand. But in Gan Eden, there's ends of madrigot, unlimited limit, unlimited, inf infinite amount of limits, of levels, and each soul is positioned in a different level. And our sages teach us that the soul looks up at the level of the next level above it, and it gets burnt. Just from seeing this light, it can't, can't take the light from the highest level. And sometimes the souls, they want to go to a higher level. That's why in essence, when the souls are being asked if they want to come down back to this world, they make a calculation. Wait a minute, I have to go through all Sadr Ishtar Shilot. I have to go through all the worlds down, go again through birth. I have to go through this entire life and I'm going to sin, and I'm going to have to go through all sorts of hardships. But from if all this, that I can do one mitzvah and go from this level of Gan Eden to this level of Gan Eden, it's worth it. I'll do it. Now, in most cases, not all the souls are that lucky to get that opportunity. But sometimes a son or a child from the, the tree below, they do some mitzvah, and they push the soul up. That's what's called Aliyat Neshama. We've seen many times that people dedicate uh, a class, they donate a, a book of books of Torah, whatever, and they say, Lilu Nishmat. So the soul will have some type of an elevation. But there are souls that they have the merit, and they can get a promotion while they're already in Gan Eden. But the, the, the deal is that they have to dip in the Hardinur. They have to go into this river of fire in order to be elevated. 
So for whatever reason that our mind will never understand, in order for me to come to a much higher level, I have to go through some type of a descending, some type of a yirida. And in our terminology in this world, this is called hardship. Yisurim, I have to, to, to suffer something. But there's a much more deeper reason for that, because when Hashem wants us to really miss Him, then He creates some type of a separation. If we would see Hashem constantly, and everything would be good, then we, wouldn't, we would get used to it. And we wouldn't yearn to be close to Hashem. We wouldn't want to. We wouldn't miss it. And you know when you notice when you miss something? When you don't have it. When you have something constantly, you don't miss it. You actually get used to it, and at some point it becomes like, okay, I can have it whenever I want. And once you're lacking it, and it can be something as simple as, as food, and something as big as a family member or whatever. And I notice that, you know, I notice how much I miss my family and how much I love my wife and kids when I go on a two-week tour and I'm not at home. Then I suddenly, wow, how, you know, my wife is so great, my kids are amazing, I miss them so much. Yeah, because I'm not, a, I'm not next to them. When I'm next to them all day long, then yeah, no, they're, they're in my eyesight. So they, excuse the term, they get on my nerves because we live in the same home. And you know, you, 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 you're in the same place with the same, same group of people, they get on your nerves and they, get, and they get you upset. Once they leave for one week or two weeks, suddenly, you, oh, I miss them so much. So same thing with Hashem. If Hashem would be around us constantly and we would see godly revelations all day long, ah, no, whatever, no, I saw it yesterday, <laughs> big deal. So Hashem says, no, I'll remove myself so you will yearn to have me, that you will miss me that you will feel the lack of not having me around you. And as Hashem wants to give us a greater level of a more of a godly revelation, so he says, okay, you have to go through some type of a process, of a purification process, let's call it, in order for you to be worthy to come and stand in a much higher and greater level. Do we understand what it means? No, and we'll never understand. The point is that we have to accept it as it is. If we're willing to accept it, then we're actually becoming the vessel to accept this godly revelation. And if I don't accept it, then I'm not even a vessel to actually accept the level that Hashem wants to give me. So a very narrow mind way to look at all these hardship is that Hashem is punishing me. And why is, why is He doing such bad things to me? And I'm such a good person and it's not fair. And That's a very narrow way of looking at things that... It comes from the same place that I repeat myself over and over. It comes from my ego. Because if I have an ego, then I, why do I deserve it? Why do I deserve to suffer? But if I diminish my ego, that I'm, you know, I'm nothing, then first of all, then even if a chas shalom I have to suffer, then, you know, it means that, <laughs> means that I deserve it. And if I'm in that level already that I, of acceptance of what's called bitul, then I accept that it's not suffering. This is what Hashem wants to put me through. Now, the more y- yeshut that I have, the greater my ego is, the more it's going to annoy me. The more things are going to affect me. The less of yeshut and ego that I have, it's not going to affect me. More than that, I'm going to be more receptive to accept things. And you know, the biggest example is that Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest prophet in history. There's not going to be anyone greater than him in prophecy. Even Mashiach is not going to be greater than Moshe Rabbeinu in prophecy. He brought down the Torah. He's the only prophet that actually speaks to Hashem face to face. We call him Moshe Rabbeinu because he actually gave us the Torah. He's constantly giving us the Torah. Maybe we don't see him with our own eyes, but up until today, the entire Torah, the whole level of Chochmah is coming through Moshe Rabbeinu. In all the tzaddikim that bring to us all the new Torah that we learned in the last 2,000 years, it's because a godly spark of Moshe Rabbeinu is shining in their neshama. So up until today, Moshe is the sphere of Chochmah, and all the Torah comes from him. So you would think that this guy will have some type of an ego, that I'm something, I'm somebody. And then you see that this guy comes to him, Korach, and he rebukes him. And not only that he rebukes him, he, he tells him that he's fake. And he's uh, manipulating. And he's a liar. And he comes up with this, whoo. You would expect a pers- any person to rise up and fight back or to scream back or to try to 
to, to, to justify it. You know what Moshe Rabbeinu does? He falls down on his knees and he cries. Why? Because he says, if somebody came to tell me that, maybe I do have this in me. Now, our natural inclination is right away to be like, what are you talking about? How dare you talk to me like this? I'm so great. But Moshe Rabbeinu was in such a high level that he was able to, to fall down and, and cry and say, if somebody was able to come and tell me that, maybe there is something like this in me. So he was the ultimate... Ultimate example of Bitul, of annulling himself, of, of I'm nothing. That's why he got the greatest godly revelation. So it all boils down to the same thing. Godly revelation, I have to suffer for that. I want Gilui Lukut, I want to be close to Hashem, I have to diminish myself. The more I diminish myself, the more I'll be able to receive more. So when Hashem, you know, crushes us, it can come in many different ways. We spoke about it two weeks ago. Or three weeks ago, that Hashem compares us to, to, to olives and to, to grapes. Am Israel is, is compared to olives and grapes. Why? Because these are the two fruits, and in order to get it, the, the juice out, it has to be crushed. You want to get oil, the olive oil, you have to crush the oil, olive. You want to get wine, you have to crush the, the, the grape. And the more the crush is stronger, then the pure oil comes out. We spoke about it a few weeks ago. That when Hashem wants to get the best out of me, then He will crush me. He will squeeze me. And I will get, the more I'm squeezed, the better comes out. We see it, what does it say about Am Israel when they were in Mitzrayim? The more they were crushed, the more they got squashed and crushed, then they became greater and greater. So this is the nature of our nation. We have to be crushed. We have to be squeezed to a corner. That's how we, we have the action of lifrots, to explode out, to, to expand. So this is something that our mind does not want to accept. Ultimately, it boils down to the same thing. It's coming from our ego. Because I don't want to suffer. And I don't want to be not comfortable right now. And I don't want to miss somebody. And I don't want to have something missing in my life. I want my life to be smooth and good. But this is just because this is how we, we paint the view of our eyes, that this is how I want. Imagine now for the first day of your life you would be brought up that, you know, bitter food is good. So you would like bitter food all day long, all, all your life you would like that. But we tend to paint the shades of our eyes and how we look at things, so we analyze it according to how we want to look at it. But the reality is that when something not good happens to me, it's first of all, to kind of recap it, is first of all, it might be my action. It might be a reaction to my action. Or it's something that I cooked 500 years ago in a different life, and now I'm coming back to fix it. More than that can be not only a, a, a reaction to my action, rather I did a negative action, I did a sin, now I have to go through a hard trip. I have a stain on my neshama, and I have to be more than happy that I'm actually being, getting the, the attention from Hashem that He's actually willing to clean me. It says in the Gemara that if a person doesn't have Yisurim for 40 days, he has to be very worried. It means that Hashem is, not, is ignoring him even. If everything is going smooth for too long, something's wrong. The Yetzirah is waiting in the corner and something is not, is not good. And if all day long I am dealing with all sorts of hardships, it means that Hashem is looking over me and He cares about me. And this is how Hashem is relating to us. But more than that, I have to be happy the fact that my tshuva was accepted and that I'm being cleansed. And sometimes this happens without me doing even tshuva. But more than that, ultimately the main reason why we have to go through this is ultimately is to receive this godly revelation, this Gilui Lukut, where we don't understand what it is. We just have to do it with a very um, humble way that this is, this is the best thing for us. And we can learn from our history that our ancestors for 210 years suffered in Mitzrayim and look what godly revelation they got. This comes to teach us and, and the, the, the amazing godly revelation we're about to receive when Mashiach is going to come. After we prepared for 2,000 years of suffering in exile, 
Now we're going to get this godly revelation. Much greater than what we saw in Ma'abad Ar Sinai in the time of giving of the Torah. So when I see things that are happening to me too, that are bad, yes, it's very easy to come from my own personal place and say, oh, it's bad because I'm suffering. You know, there's always a, good, a, good, a big question when somebody dies, chas v'shalom, who's the one who suffers? Why, why, why does a person mourn and cry? Do you cry because the person died? Or do you cry because you are now going to miss that person? So we always, we mourn and we cry because I'm going to miss that person. He's not going to miss me. He's, uh, he's in a better place now. I'm not crying and mourning the fact that they left the world and now they're not going to enjoy this beautiful world anymore. No, I'm crying because I'm sad and I'm not going to see my loved one anymore. So the one who's suffering, me is, is, suffering here is me and I'm mourning my suffering, not the loss of that person. So the thing is that always when we, we if you, you can turn it around to all, any situation, when I'm suffering, it means that my, my ego is telling me, hey, I'm lacking now something. But if I'm accepting the fact that I'm not lacking nothing, that's how Hashem wants it to be, and I accept that this is what's coming from Hashem, then I say, okay, that's, that's, what, I'm, what, that's what I'm getting today. And the Mishnah says, Ezra Ashira Samech Bechilko, who is the real rich person that is happy with what he has. So he has a little bit, so he's happy with that. It's very easy to, to, transform, to transform the situation and say, oh, this is suffering, I'm lacking something. One can look at it, I'm not lacking nothing. I'm actually having what I'm supposed to get. So I can look at it as a loss and I can look at it as, no, that's, that's what I'm supposed to have. And, you know, next week I'll have more, next year I'll have a better. The world is round. One time you're up, one time you're down. It's like a, a how do you say Galgalanak, a Ferris wheel? When you're up, you have a beautiful view, everything's good. But then a few minutes later, you're down again. And somebody else is above you. And our life is constantly a wheel, up and down, up and down. Nature, human nature is when you're up and things are good, then everything's fine, and that's when you forget Hashem. When you're down, that's when you suddenly remember Hashem, and people start screaming to Hashem, help me, forgive me. Then you start reflecting on yourself. The point is to, to thank Hashem also when you're in a very low place. So to kind of sum it up, why bad things happen to good people, first of all, everybody's good. The definition of good people is, a, is you know, that's, that's a very broad definition. When somebody says in a terror attack, chas v'shalom, that person died, why does bad things happen to good people? What, the other people, they get murdered, they're not good? The fact that they don't keep Torah and mitzvahs doesn't mean that they're not good. That's first of all. Everybody's good in the eyes of Hashem. How it looks on the outside, that doesn't define a person if he's good or not. So even when we see chas v'shalom, lo alenu, people who in the, on the external part, they look like this, and it's very easy to say, why does bad things happen to good people? I also think that when the people who don't look on their external part, something like this happens, it's also, they're also good people. So one might say, okay, why does bad things happen to everybody? You can't define it as dafka to the good people, because everybody's good. Maybe for that particular moment, that person is not Torah observant, doesn't mean that the person is not good. He still has a godly soul, and, 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 and in the eyes of Hashem, that person is a diamond. More than that, when Hashem is looking at us from above, this doesn't make me good. The fact that I look like this, Hashem is looking at us as above, as all this equal. So he's like just looking, this person is more observant, this person is less observant. That's it. Hashem doesn't look at a person, Hashem loves the reshaim exactly like he likes the tzaddikim. And this is the true level of a tzaddik. There's a great question. What is a real tzaddik? Not the one who does mitzvahs all day long and he doesn't have any avarice. That's a very high level. But a real tzaddik? A real true tzaddik is a person who loves the wicked person the exact way, the same level how he likes the tzaddik, a different tzaddik. That's a real tzaddik. That he looks at a wicked person and he doesn't see anything bad in him. He loves him just the same. This is a real tzaddik, a real true tzaddik. And that's how Hashem is looking at us. Hashem doesn't look at the beard and the yarmulke and the dress and says, oh, he's good, he's not good. It's our definition, good, not good. Better to say, right now, that person is not observant. He's not doing Torah and mitzvahs. Okay. So no matter what we do, God will always love us and whatever. So 
people could just do whatever they want to do. And but that's a very bad attitude. It's, no, first of all, that's a very bad attitude that a lot of people say, oh, God loves me, I can do whatever I want. God loves you, but he still gave you rules. It's almost like me saying... No. He loves everybody the same way, but it doesn't mean that he lets you break the rules. The easiest way to explain it is look at a parent. I have six kids, Baruch Hashem. I love all the kids exactly the same. The one who does more things and he does less problems and he has straight A's and he ca always comes with me to shul and always does everything that, you know, in my eyes is best, what it means I love him more than the other kid that is a little bit shovav and he makes a lot of trouble. I like them just the best, but there's rules. Shem loves everybody the same, but he tells you, I love you, but don't break my rules. I gave you rules. And if I have to punish you, I'll punish you. And if I have to patch you because you did something wrong, I'll patch you. And when you do something good, I'm going to reward you. But I love you just the same. I don't love you less because you don't follow my rules. It's a very bad attitude that a lot of people say, oh, God loves me. He'll forgive me. It's the worst attitude ever. That person is living in a denial that Hashem loves him, he'll be merciful, and I can do whatever I want. It doesn't work like that. The easiest way to explain it is imagine a judge. The highest level judge in the most highest level court, in the Supreme Court. Then his kid gets pulled over, driving drunk, driving 200 kilometers an hour, drunk. Now he gets arrested. Now there's a big problem. The father can get him out like that. He's the highest level judge in the, in the system. Now, if he lets him out, what are they going to say? Oh, he's doing protectia? He's, uh, giving a, he's taking his kid out? That's not fair. But if he doesn't get him out, then people say, what kind of a father is that? He's not coming to help his kid? He has power. He can get him out. So he's in a, how do you call it? Catch 21, catch 22? He can do this, he can do this. Kind of the same thing with Hashem. Hashem put rules in this world. Now, you know, one of his kids is messed up. So he says, what can I do? I can't just pull him out now because there's rules. And I'm, I can't go around the rules because it's my son. So it's a very wrong attitude to say, God loves me, I can do whatever I want. In essence, yes, God loves us all equal. The fact that right now a person is not Torah observant and he does a lot of bad things, it doesn't mean that Hashem hates him. There's still going to be judgment. The person will still have to come and, and give judgment. And if Hashem will have to punish him, we will punish him. Hashem created the world with rules. And these rules are not made to be broken. And Hashem doesn't break the rules. And you know, this is the difference between the, the, the din in this world and the din in the, in, the, in, the, in the spiritual world. In this world, there are what's called in our language, protectia. And all sorts of manipulations and you bribery in, in, in Hashem's court there's no such a thing the din is din emet there's no, you <laughs> can't bend the rules there are a book of rules Hashem says I don't care who you are what you did, how much Torah you have these are the rules I don't break the rules, you can break the rules so it's not that Hashem loves you less or Hashem loves somebody less if he doesn't follow the Torah. That's not the, the point. The point is that Hashem is like a father and he loves the children all equal. The fact that one child is going away from the way that Hashem wants him to go, that doesn't stop him from loving him. But at the same time, it also doesn't prevent him from educating him. I love my kid more than anything, but if my kid will do something wrong, I have to punish him. It's not that I hate the kid. I have to educate him, and if I don't educate him, I'm actually doing the m worse with my kid. Okay, so if your kid, let's say, someone that knows what Torah and they don't follow it, how would they know how to punish? You said your kid is a guilty person, but if they don't know, then they're talking, talking about a parent and a child? Or a God and a... It's not the same situation. I mean, like, if your kid knows something, Well, this is a this is totally different. It's totally off the subject. The thing is that this is just to compare the the concept. But Hashem doesn't deal with us how I would deal with my kids. 
Hashem is dealing with us with a completely different way. It's totally off the subjects. Maybe later we'll do some times with questions and answers. The point is that Hashem looks at all of us the same. Hashem doesn't see us different if I'm wearing a yarmulke or if I don't wear a yarmulke. If he's happy with the fact or not, that's a totally different thing. If I'm making my, my, my father in heaven happy that I follow his Torah or not, that's a totally different thing. I'm talking about the fact that Hashem sees us all as one thing. He sees all the, all the Jews as diamonds. You know, he sees all his creations as diamonds. It's a very wrong attitude to say, oh, Hashem only loves the Jews and the non-Jews he doesn't like. I don't like that attitude. It's, not, it's a wrong attitude. It's not how Hashem sees. Hashem likes all people in the world. Maybe not in the same level. We can't judge how Hashem looks at us. Nobody can decide how Hashem looks at us. But ultimately, Hashem loves everything that He creates. We learn it from many different places, but one of the places that we learn is when the Egyptians were drowning and the angels wanted to sing, you know, from happiness. He's like, are you singing when my briot, my creatures are drowning now? A minute before that, they wanted to kill the Jews, but they're still my creature. I still created them and they're still drowning now. Don't, 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 don't be happy now with that. So the point is that we don't know how the cheshbonot of Hashem, the, the, how Hashem is looking at things. But I'm telling you for the fact how Hashem is looking for, or at us from above, He sees us all equal. The fact that one person is more observant than the other, one is less observant, that has nothing to do with it. That, yeah, that person has to deal with, with their lifestyle. At some point they're going to have to deal with how they behave. But it doesn't change the love of Hashem to, our, to, our, to each and every one of us. And it doesn't mean that one will get more hardship, less hardship. It has nothing to do with it. The point is that there's, a, there's cheshbonot in Shemaim. There's, there's, there's an account. A person did A, there's going to be a reaction. A person did B, there's going to be a reaction to that. You have debt from a previous re reincarnation, you come back, you pay it. There's, there's, everything is calculated in the, in the heavenly courts. And ultimately, if I have a little child, and my little child has a problem with stealing, and every time that he steals, I punish him because I want to teach him that it's very bad to steal. In his limited eyes, I'm the worst father in the world because I take his toys and I don't let him play and I put him in the corner and I scream at him, whatever I need to do. In his eyes, I'm the worst father in the world. But when I'm looking at it, I don't care if he thinks I'm the worst father in the world. I need to educate him how bad it is to steal. And if he gets it with a little scream, Fine, if he doesn't get it and he has to be punished over and over and over, but eventually the person will grow up a normal human being that doesn't steal anymore, then I did my job. And I was able to define and to reshape that person that he doesn't go and does something bad. Whether it's right now a, a, a precept in the Torah or it's just a, a, a human thing. So the thing is that a father needs to educate his, his child because the, the result is something good. So in a lot of the cases, Hashem is putting us in a situation that we don't like it, but that's our own problem. If I don't like something, it's me. It's, I'm the problem. Because a, a, a person that his mind is aligned with Ratzon Elion, with the, with the supreme will, Something bad happens, he says, okay, that's what Hashem wants. Means that he knows much better than me what is good for me right now. And when I don't agree with it, means that my, the, problem, the, the, the problem is internal. It's my own problem. It's not comfortable for me right now to go through this, and I'm not happy with that. Not, it doesn't mean that Hashem is consulting with me what's good for me and what's not good for me. The point is what I started saying before with about the good things, the, the bad things to good, good people, in Hashem's eyes, everybody's good, so you can't really define why do bad things happen to good people, because in Hashem's eyes, everybody's good. There may be right now, they're not following His Torah. That's a definition. But in general, everything that happens, happens with, with, with a reason. We don't even know it. The Zohar even explains that our Neshama has many different sparks to it, and in each reincarnation, the sparks get spread in different places. So sometimes, you know, one piece, one neshama gets spread in different types of bodies. We don't, know, we don't really understand why everything is happening. One time my neshama will come here to fix something, 
And the fact that he has to go through some type of suffering is actually to heal something. The easiest way to explain it, imagine you see a person that chas v'shalom gets diagnosed with a very severe disease. And the doctors tell him, we have to operate right now. If we don't operate right now, you're going to lose your life. You're going to die. Right away, they pull him into the emergency room. And as they're pulling him to the emergency room, they, you know, covering him and doing the whole thing. And then they're putting him to sleep. And then the doctors come and cut pieces of the body. And, and then they sew him up. And then the person has to go through a couple weeks of, of, of healing and unbelievable pain. And then the person has to go through rehab and half a year of pain in the hospital. But then he's back on his feet and he's saved. Now if you now focus, you squeeze the timeline to the moment that the doctors cut his body and blood squirts everywhere. And then you stop the, the, the movie and what you see, all you see is horror. But then spread again, spread again the timeline and wait, wait a minute. It was one small act in order to save his life, to heal him. And yes, the healing process was a hard half a year. He had to go through rehab and whatever he had to go through and pain. And, but now he got his life back and he's healed and he can enjoy the rest of his life. So we tend to stop the timeline exactly where it hurts the most. And then we analyze the situation. Oh! Why is this bad thing happening to me or to any other person, the good person? Yeah, but stretch the timeline and you'll see that it's a phase in a process. And sometimes the healing, the pain of the healing, that's what we see it as hardship. And it's actually a healing. We just don't see it that way. So it's a very wrong question to ask why does, why does bad things happen to good people? Because we're ultimately all good, and it's part of the process, but we, we don't really understand. And the point is not to try to understand, it's just to accept it. And how it applies to each and every one of us, because, you know, we're all good. But we all suffer through different things in our life. How it applies to each and every one of us, that in, in our entire life, we're going to go through these stumbling blocks. How I see it is our life is a script. Hashem is the producer. And each and every one of you were hired to perform in the movie. You're the, the star of the movie. And there's a script. And you go through the script. And through the script, there are, you go on speed bumps. You drive, 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 up a speed bump, another speed bump. And every speed bump is something that shakes you in your life. The question is, how are you, how you passing on this speed bump? If you understand that this is part of the script, and you start whining, well, you don't. You know, there's a great question of what's free choice. People think free choice is if I wake up in the morning, if I put a, a white shirt or a blue shirt. This is not free choice. And the, the free choice on the surface to explain it is that Hashem puts a situation in front of you and He wants to see what you're going to do. He's going to put an opportunity for you to do a mitzvah and He says, okay, now let's see what He's going to do. He's going to do the mitzvah, I'm not going to do the mitzvah. Same thing with a, the opposite of a mitzvah. Shem will put in front of you a temptation to do something, and he says, okay, now let's see if they're going to do it. They're sitting up in Shammai like that. They're putting bets. He's going to do it. He's not going to do it. He's going to do it. A whole Beit Din of Shammai are sitting and they're waiting to see what's going to be the decision. Shem knows what's going to be the decision. Hashem doesn't have time. He sees forward. But Hashem puts a situation in front of us. He wants to see how we're going to deal with it. And if I chas v'shalom do the wrong decision, then in Shammayim they're like, ah, they're getting all upset up there. And if I did the right decision, and I was about to steal, about to lie, about to fail, and I held myself, they're opening champagne bottles in Shammayim. Can you imagine what's going on in Shammayim? Fourth of July, fireworks in Shammayim. He didn't do it! He didn't lie! This is my free choice if I'm going to choose to do good or choose to be bad. But the ultimate free choice, the ultimate free choice is Hashem is going to push me. He's going to send his army, Malachim, angels, and the Yetzirah. He's going to send whoever he wants to push me, so I'll fall down. Now he wants to see how I get up. And the real free choice is if I choose to whine or if I choose to accept that it's from Hashem. And if I whine, 
and I cry, why? I'm such a good person, why is this happening to me? Then I, this is, I lost here the, 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 the game of the free choice. But I, I have the choice to say, it's from Hashem. And this issue happened right now from Hashem. And right now I'm suffering because that's, that's the speed bump. That's part of the script. And I can suffer with a smile on my face. And I can be bitter. And if I'm bitter, then I, suffer. I, I make myself suffer. I bring on myself half of the, the, the suffering that I go through because I look at it as a bad thing. But a good person can say, it's, it's a speed bump. I had to fall right now. And you know, the fact that I get up and I brush the dirt off and I move on, that's, that's how I got my check. Okay, one, you got a point. Every Friday night, we're reading Lecha Dodi. The fourth pasuk, we read, V'itnari ma'afar kumi. The translation is, get up from the dirt and brush off the dirt. Get up and brush off the dirt. And wear the garments of the glory of my nation. It means Hashem pushes you. And He says, okay, now let's see if He gets up. And I want to see when He gets up, He's going to complain. Or if He's going to brush off the dirt. And say, okay, let's move on. Nothing happened. That's when you win. This is the free choice. To choose... If I'm accepting what Hashem is giving it to me, if it's coming from Hashem or if it's not coming from Hashem. That's a free choice. Because most people fail and they say, it's not coming from Hashem. That person did it to me. She did it to me. He did that to me. No, he didn't do anything. Hashem did it. Hashem turned everything around and that's the situation. So the ultimate suffering and hardship and problems and issues, it's just Hashem's script. And sometimes it doesn't look as nice as we want to, but that's the script. And I can accept the script, and I cannot accept it. And if I don't accept, accept it, then the hardship and the suffering is greater. And if I do accept it, I say, okay. Look at sometimes you see these people, Hashem Yerachem, they lose somebody now, lately, in the terror attacks. They say, that's the will of Hashem. That's it, they accept it. It's hard for them. They suffer, but they accept the reality. It's easier to accept things when you let Hashem come into your life. What stops Hashem coming into our life is, um, is my own ego. If I, if I have ego, Hashem will not dwell with me. Hashem says, I cannot dwell with a, with a place that there's Yeshut, there's the ego. I want Hashem in my life, then I have to make space for Hashem. And by default, I accept everything that Hashem gives me. So ultimately, the bad things that happen to us, I wouldn't define them as bad. I would just define them as part of my path, and it's part of my test. How am I dealing with it? And A, yes, maybe I did something wrong. Something bad happens to me. That's what it says in the Gemara. Something bad happens to me. If I have to look, maybe I did something wrong. And if this is not the case, okay, maybe something from a re previous reincarnation. If that's not the case, maybe I did some sin 20 years ago. Now, now I'm getting the, the bill. People think that a person does a sin and right away he gets the bill. Sometimes the bill comes 20 years later. And the person is like, hey, well, where is this coming from? Yeah, 20 years ago you did something. Now it's time to pay the bill. That's why our sages say that we have to accept the yesurim the, ba'ava, the hardship with love, because it's Hashem is washing me now. And ultimately, Hashem is preparing us and cleaning us for the ultimate Gilui Lukud, the godly revelation that's going to come in the time of Mashiach. And I'll tell you one story, and then we're going to finish, and you can ask some questions. There was once a story that there was a king, and he called his, one of his servants, the, the head of the servants, and he told him, I want you to take all the barrels from the, from the storage, and we're going to have a party, and I want you to take them down to the river and fill them up with water and bring them up. And I'm going on a trip, I'm going to be back in such an amount of time, and when I come up, I want these barrels full of water. Okay, the servant gets all the workers, they go down, they fill the barrels full of water, they put them on the wagons, they start going up in the, in the hill towards back to the palace, and you know, the wagons are all shaking. And all the barrels had uh, cracks in them. So all the water starts splashing all over the place. And they don't know what to do. The higher they, they climb on the mountain, more water is splashing out. And at some point, they stop the wagon. They're like, listen, we have a problem here. All the water is 
splashing out from the cracks and the holes. By the time we get up to the palace, the barrels will be empty. So they start arguing, what should we do? Should we go back and fill them up? What should we do? The guy says, we don't have time. We have to be here. This is a deadline. If we're not going to be up there, the king is going to be upset. We're going to have a problem. So the decision was they're continue going. And they're going up in the mountain and the barrels are all shaking and the water splashing all over the place. By the time they come up, the water barrels are completely empty. Now what we're going to do? Now we have to face the king. So they're all shivering. The king is about to come. They don't know what what's going to happen. Maybe they're going to be severely punished. The king comes and the main servant approaches the king and says, listen, you know, we have a problem. The, the barrels are all cracked and broken and all the water ran out and, and the barrels are completely empty. And he's uh, thinking that he's about to get his head chopped off and the king tells him, oh, that's what I wanted. And they're all shocked. What? So the king says, but, but don't you think I know that the barrels are all broken? I know they're broken. But you know how many years these barrels are sitting in storage? You know how dusty they are? You know how dirty they are? The only way to clean it is to fill them up with water and to climb all the way up on the mountain. And the shaking of the barrels is washing the barrels. Now the barrels are clean. Now go and fix the barrels and go to the wine cellar and fill the barrels with wine. And let's go to our party. So the suffering of the exile is, you know, this, this shaking of the, the barrel is all dirty from inside. Shem is shaking us already for 2,000 years with a lot of water. So for us it's shaking and hardship and suffering, but we have to look at it as one big timeline that now Shem at the time of the Gula will say, okay, oh, now your bodies are all clean from this hardship, from the suffering. Now it's time to seal all the holes, pour the wine in, let's go to the Gula. So ultimately, all this 2,000 years of suffering is to prepare us to the coming of Mashiach, that when the Gula will come, the redemption will come, we'll be such a clear ui, such a worthy vessel, and the Gilui Lukud, the godly revelation that we're going to receive, is going to be 10 times, if not 100 times greater than what the Jews saw in Mount Sinai, now Sinai. They had to suffer 210 years to see this Gilu Lakut. We're suffering for 2,000 years. Just imagine what type of godly revelation we're about to get very soon. So every time something bad happens to you, you have to look at it in a much more general way and say, even though, let's imagine right now it's not my actions, and let's imagine now it's not from a reincarnation and all the rest of the things then it's part of the preparations from the, for the ultimate redemption. And once the redemption is going to happen, I'm going to look back and be like, it was worth all this hard, hardship. Because now I'm going to be worthy to be on front line at the time when Mashiach is going to reveal this godly revelation that we can't even understand in our mind. So Bezat Hashem, we should be worthy to see this Gilui Lakut very soon. And the suffering should stop. And no hardship should be... Eh? For anyone, the good or the bad, we're all good. Bezrat Hashem, very soon when Mashiach is going to come, is also going to reveal to us all the problems that we didn't understand up to now. Everything is going to be obvious. We'll be able to continue, head up to the Geula, Mitit Vashlema, and we should see it very soon with our eyes. And Bezrat Hashem, at this point, there's not going to be any more suffering and anything bad happening to anyone, Am Israel and the rest of the nations.